Hello and welcome back. I'm Chris and this is Curiously Polar. And with me again is Mario Aquarone. How are you today? Hello, Chris Marquard. Yes, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine <laughs> sitting here in my office. We're going to refer to each other with, with first and last name from yes, now on. Yes, <laughs> and last name. Yes, we are going to be D's afterwards. Yeah, uh, Z. Um, the, uh, yeah, I'm sitting here in my office. It's uh, by Tromso. Tromso. Yeah, and uh, we are sitting in the same lo localization as the Arctic Council Secretariat. And uh, as you know, the Arctic Council has a little bit of a break or a pause it's called because why of the could war in be? ukraine um we, we are recording yeah. this okay just to put a date on it um we're recording this end of may um mm -hmm. this might be yes. an episode that comes out a bit later but just to make sure yeah. this is placed in time because at this point no one really knows how things mm -hmm. are going or going to exactly. go in the future so the exactly. ukraine conflict or conflict though the war against ukraine is um putting a bit of a wrench into the Arctic Council proceedings. Yes, exactly. So the, there is a, there is a, a lot of uh, things that are happening. There are a lot of things that are happening in, the, in relation to the war. And one other thing that we are seeing is uh, uh, sanctions against uh, Russia. Right. And uh, and up here uh, we uh, have a, a newspaper that we have used many times before, which is called the Barents Observer, and they report of a, a quite a quite a big project that is they call it the biggest Arctic construction site that uh, could turn into ghost towns. And now the picture above is of the uh, uh, shipyard, um, the uh, LNG construction. Uh, center so the uh, liquid natural yard, gas called, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, belokamenka yard outside murmansk and it's they are building a, a gravity based structure so the uh, essentially it's like the oil platforms the floating oil platforms so the gravity big structures right. that are held in place by gravity and um, and uh, this uh, Picture is by uh, uh, is for uh, a uh, liquid natural gas project, so uh, extraction of liquid natural gases, and we have heard about the sanctions against the, the gas that uh, is coming from Russia, and uh, uh, they uh, this the the sanctions have pushed to uh, lots of investment and countries to pull out of this uh, project because, uh, I mean, we know that the large projects are usually invested, I mean, composed of different parts of it, but they also receive investments from several, uh, several countries. And, uh, and uh, they probably, I mean, with this uh, LNG, uh, Arctic LNG2 project, they will probably not be able to complete the uh, the project in the uh, in the period that was set to do this and right. uh, this is uh, quite a problem it means uh, and i would like i brought this up because it's uh, a large connection between or a very tight connection between what happens in the arctic also at the industrial level and what happens around the globe Right. So, um, so, 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 just, just for my understanding, this is a Russian construction site. Yes. Um, the, and it the mean, construction and, and that site. means that with with all the sanctions, meaning countries are uh, getting less and less LNG from the Russians. They just don't have a a reason to continue building this or not, the financing yeah, for it. Yeah. No, so on. Not only. Not only. Not only. It's it's quite complex. I mean the. Uh, the project is managed by a French company and they are not pulling out of it. They are still doing it there. Okay. But for example, part of the construction, I mean, this, this is a construction site, but the structures are actually built elsewhere and then assembled up in the Arctic. So as you know, where is that most of the manufacturing is happening in the world? Well, you know, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Where, which which country produces most of goods in the world, <laughs> and we're talking about China. So oh, uh, I'm referring course. to China. So <laughs> what so was I the, thinking? Yes, of course. The, the, yeah, the structures that need to be 
assembled at this uh, uh, Belokamenka uh, yard are coming from China. But the mm. Chinese yard has halted cooperation with the Article and G project. So in spite of China officially not having sanctions, but somehow, I mean, they are, it's, it's also a question of, of politics. I mean, China doesn't sanction Russia directly, but there are delays and things. And in this case, the, there is a halt in the cooperation on this. So uh, uh, there is also uh, Linde and Siemens uh, from Europe that have uh, stopped cooperation with, uh, with, these, uh, with, the, with this uh, construction. And, uh, and this means that there is a problem in the construction of these, but also for the people that are working and for their area, for the general development and economic uh, life of the area. Because this yard has 20,000 employees and they come from all over the world, actually, from Central Asia, from Turkey, from Europe. I mean, there are lots of employees and they all live in Murmansk. So if they do not have work anymore they will probably travel back to their country of origin and they will leave their apartments and this is actually creating a wave of uh, housing problems or a problem in the housing market there are going mm -hmm. to be lots of houses empty and therefore prices are going to plummet and uh, services are going not going to be i mean the the whole economy of the region is going to be affected by this so it's um, the, we have a war in Ukraine that has a very big impact on Arctic economic life here. So, uh, so it's um, it's quite uh, quite uh, quite something, and it is not something that can be solved immediately because these structures is not something that you can. They are, they are not structures that can be built anywhere else in Russia. Like okay, we keep it within the country, even though Russia is. A large and uh, industrialized country, but it cannot produce these structures with the same specification in the time that is needed for the investment to be running. So, yeah, quite uh, quite something uh, for uh, for the area here. It's only uh, what not even uh, a thousand kilometer away. We have Murmansk, and uh, it's close by Tromsø. I. We'll hmm. see how this event evolves. So, okay. so much for, for one, this. One to watch. And, uh, yeah, one to watch. And uh, it's uh, very big connections. And as you can see, there's also connections to China and France, Europe, anywhere. Not just gas to Everything Europe and therefore Germany. Is intertwined. Yes, especially this. <sighs> um, yeah. But right. this is not only, I mean, this is a very much Arctic uh, conflict uh, conflict-related uh, um, uh, subjects. Another area that is affected by the uh, war in Ukraine and uh, the, um, the sanctions and the uh, block uh, of, uh, like blocking of exchange of, uh, of information and, and money and, and flow of personnel is the science that is happening in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. So I uh, suggested uh, looking at this uh, Arctic Today articles about uh, how um, the cooperation, the scientific cooperation for uh, research in the Bering Strait is coming to a halt. And uh, it is, uh, to a lesser degree, there is also something happening here in the uh, in the Barents, in the but uh, we have in the Bering Strait, we have a lot of cooperation, of course. We have polar bears that are going from the one side to the other, uh, of the, uh, from Alaska to Siberia. But uh, we have also quite, quite new things that have been happening because of uh, climate change. There are some algal toxin risks. There is a, an algae, a dinoflagellate called like Alexandrium catanella, that is a, an algae that produces a toxin that causes 
paralytic shellfish poisoning, which doesn't sound very nice. You know, yeah. like you eat. Uh, makes yeah. me itch just by. It I have just no makes idea what itch. it is, but it sounds. <laughs> Imagine <awful. laughs> exactly, and and there is more and more of this algae. Uh, this is a, a planktonic algae, um, and uh, it does uh, grow in the water, in the coastal waters, in the bearings, in the. Uh, uh, Bering Strait, and uh, it has been shown to affect uh, seal populations, especially, but uh, because they are very visible when you have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of seals that are dying out there. But also, it has an influence on the local populations because, uh, like on both sides of the Bering Strait uh, and the Chachki Sea, you have uh, locals that uh, feed on. Uh, game on uh, on seals on seal meat and uh, and if you are eating other things from the sea you might ingest this uh, toxin and it's not uh, not actually quite nice but nowadays like if you have to have a monitoring system for the spreading of this algal toxin you want to have it on the two sides of the border between Russia and the US Makes and in sense, this yeah. case it doesn't it doesn't work this way. So right now, the system that was set up for looking at this uh, on a holistic base is divided between Russia and and the United States, and therefore you don't have a simultaneous uh, look at the pictures. Uh, the same, uh, or similarly, you have, as I mentioned, for the polar bears, uh, walruses. There have been lots of uh, lots of activities for. Uh, surveying uh, marine mammals, polar bears, for example, and walruses in the Wrangell Island, uh, which is in the uh, uh, Russian part. It's a Russian island northeast of, uh, of Siberia. And uh, uh, that is something that will not be continued because the uh, US scientists that were going to participate in surveys to go over to the... Uh, Russian Arctic are not going there anymore. Uh, U.S. vessels are not entering the Russian Arctic. They cannot retrieve moorings with instruments. So I was listening uh, the other day to uh, one of our scientists uh, called uh, John Walsh. He's at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, a climate scientist, uh, very, very highly prized uh, uh, scientist. And he was uh, quite worried about the moorings that are collecting oceanographic information. So these buoys that collect over a column in the sea lots of information about uh, the actual conditions that record the conditions, these need to be serviced and the data needs to be downloaded every, let's say, year. And now if we are not going over the summer, if it's not possible to retrieve the data, then there is going to be a hiatus in the data. I mean, you need to retrieve the data, change the batteries, and put them out again in order to have a continuous of data. Hmm. There are uh, Tundra uh, monitoring stations. There is one uh, that is uh, uh, a cooperation between Germany and Russia that was just been, had just been established and uh, just worked for a few years. And, uh, and now uh, it's totally isolated. So the local scientists, because of course the scientists in Russia are extremely capable and they can do the, <laughs> their, their job, but but if you do not have enough personnel to man the station and to do the uh, uh, readings, to record the uh, the data, then there are problems of continuity. So I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure even though most uh, countries, most uh, scientists in the outside of Russia have been discouraged, if not forbidden, to have contact with the Russian counterparts. Um, the, uh, the problems are that the Russian scientists are left on their own, and not only on their own for working, so their intellectual work, but also without money, financial support for cooperation projects. And you know that even for uh, a meteorological station, you need money to run it, and uh, oh. it's not uh, money that is now coming directly from the Russian government in total, all of these cooperation projects have uh, been uh, stopping or put into a pause. And this is quite sad. But let's hope that we have a solution soon and uh, we'll be able to, to start again. With, all right. Um, Do we have mm -hmm. 
a positive note to end this episode on. <laughs> yes, a positive note. Well, uh, I was, uh, of course, there is a lot about Ukraine. And now I would like to bring a, uh, an article about um, Kiev. So about something okay. that has been found in a digging in Kiev, uh, found some 15 years ago. And that is a connection to the Arctic. Now, this is a, a, an article from the uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society. So uh, it's a, a British journal, actually it's called Proceedings of the Royal Society B, by, because it's biological sciences, but it's mm. actually history, it's paleontology or uh, history. And uh, in a digging in uh, Kiev, uh, there have been, there's like, the archaeologists or the, or the diggers have found walruses and like walrus skulls and pieces of the skull of a walrus, like on That's the top left of the picture. South. Yes, exactly. So you see a full skull top left, you see the nose on the yeah. top right and bottom left or the, the nostril and a fragment of, I think that is a fragment of the uh, uh, tooth canal. Of the For tusks. those listening, this is uh, linked in the show notes. So um, yes, interesting. So yeah. the uh, it's uh, it's a tusk socket. Yes, um, the um, the interesting part is they say like why why is there walrus in did, are there walruses in uh, Kiev? Did the walrus at one point did the did the Arctic at one point extend uh, its yeah. cold tendrils down to Kiev <laughs> or how did this work? Yes. Now the uh, yeah this uh, this is uh, this is connected of course to Viking history I can reveal ah. and uh, since uh, Kiev has been founded at least for what we know uh, is been uh, founded uh, by the uh, by the Vikings by the Swedish Vikings um it's uh, a, a connection between the Mediterranean the Black Sea and the Baltic so there is a pretty pretty good idea of who brought these walrus uh, remains to Kiev and uh, it was the Vikings of course, of uh, course. but where are these walruses from and now we're talking about trying to figure out i mean are these walruses that were in the baltic right now for example there is a walrus in denmark there have been walruses in the uk recently so there are walruses in the north sea and historically there are records that have been quite a lot of walruses down in the north sea that then have been chased out by being by or chased out have been hunted <laughs> they've been slaughtered much, yeah. Yeah. slaughtered yes that's uh, quite a, quite something so like uh, and uh, and we know also that walruses and walrus ivory was the main uh, the main product for paying the tribute to the Vatican by mm -hmm. the Vikings and especially by the Vikings in Very Greenland. I didn't know that. So the these uh, these researchers they uh, that uh, were looking at these they looked at uh, at uh, a, a way of connecting these remains to where the uh, where the uh, walruses were actually originating from and so they looked at a, uh, a at the dna of these uh, walruses also oh, you can, you can uh, still extract something DNA called a dna them? yes okay they uh, you can and uh, they found out uh, with these and also using a stable isotope so um, carbon 13 and nitrogen 15 and sulfur 34 uh, these are uh, in bone collagen and they are right. deposited in in there because of course you have like carbon nitrogen and sulfur in the, in the collagen in the proteins and uh, and the ratio between these isotopes, we have had it a long time ago as well about the isotope ratio and what you can say, but the ratio between these isotopes is characteristics of the diet, but also of where the diet is coming from. If you make a, like you mm -hmm. can take pieces of the puzzle, do a, a, a crime scene investigation and see like these are coming from, from there. And well, what they found out is that these are actually walruses. At least a few of them are walruses from Greenland. So imagine, and uh, you, there was a map in the article that you might be 
that you might be checking. Yeah. Um, the uh, the map shows the North Atlantic. You have with stars. You have presence of uh, like uh, samples, uh, like recent samples that are controls that are from Greenland, Iceland, the Svalbard area, and northern Norway uh, that are made in the analysis. They are inserted in the analysis to try to figure out whether there are similarities or or there is a problem with the analysis. And they have uh, then uh, in this map shown, they show where are the uh, most likely origins of the, of the rostra. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the, and, and they also looked at, uh, at other medieval samples because we are talking about the middle ages here. And uh, it's quite clear that there was a big uh, trade route between Greenland and Kiev in the mm -hmm. Middle Ages. Wow. I mean, we're talking about, yeah, between the year 1000, beginning on the Viking area, 800 or something, and, uh, <laughs> and the, uh, the uh, 11th, yeah, 13th century. I've been to That's... Greenland with modern tra tra travel means. Um, so just thinking back in the Middle Ages, this being a main trade route or an important trade route, um, that... <laughs> Exactly, and, and the main trade yeah. route is actually quite important because we are not talking just about one little sample because these finds in Kiev are one set of samples that have been found by about 15 uh, specimens, uh, 15 different walruses, but there are actually a lot of other specimens. There are mm. like chess pieces, there are ornamental pieces made of walrus ivory right. that are all over the Mediterranean and uh, all over like also the Near East uh, eastern east of Europe, so it's it's uh, it gives us an idea of how how connected the medieval world was. Because if you think about the name of the rose, <laughs> just uh, thinking about Umberto yes. Eco and the in the film, and there you find this uh, like the medieval world is uh, a world where people were isolated. They were just peasants staying exactly in the same place. And probably it was true that some people never moved from the house where they were born, practically, but uh, or were not allowed to do so. But trade was pretty important. And there were nations and peoples, or because it was not really, we can't really call the Vikings a nation, but uh, more of a, a, a group of people, since there were several several nations that were not organized the same way, but uh, it's uh, as we, as other parts of Europe. So, uh, so it's, it's important to see that there was a lot of travel and in a commercial activity happening between Greenland and Europe already a thousand right. years ago. Practically. Walrus remains yeah. in Kiev. Okay. That... Yeah. I hope that this was, uh, <laughs> was this, less of yeah, a gloomy, this... <laughs> a gloomy thing. It is, it is, it, I find this very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, thanks for sharing that. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone who was listening or watching. We're on YouTube as well. If you're listening to this, if you're watching this and want to put this in your, in your podcast client, just search for Curiously Polar. We're easy to find. And uh, then you will get this automatically every week. Um, we are online at curiouslypolar.com. We are on the on the Twitters and um, that's a good place to contact us until next time everyone take care and bye 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 bye